everyone, Cleo here, welcome to my channel. I'm here to bring you something that is totally long overdue and totally not relevant anymore because we are a new year and there is a new long list out there. But I am giving you the, my review for the short list for the Man Booker Prize of 2018. Yes, I finally managed to squeeze my way through this. I did this in the month of July, but uh, I wanted to... I've just had some busy times uh, at the end of July, beginning of August, so I haven't really been able to post yet, uh, well, to film it yet, and then uh, I got the flu, so then I also didn't have the voice to film anymore. So without further ado, let's finally get into it. Now, um, as I already mentioned, I'm very well aware that there's already a 2019 long list out there, but I'm really intending to this year get a head start on it. So my idea is in the month of September to already get some of these books out of the way. Um, I basically just uh, came, well, I basically started too late last year. I mean, I think, well, I only read Milkman after it was after it had already won, I had read none of the other books on the shortlist before. So now I'm at least uh, trying to get some of the long lists done before the short list is announced. Hopefully some of those will be in the short list as well, so that by the time that I get around to the short list, I also have less of them to do. But so there were six books on the short list for the Man Booker Prize in 2018, and I'll still give you my thoughts on them because, I mean, I also read a lot of backlisted books, so if you're, you're oh, if you are still looking for a very good recommendation for 2000 from uh, a book that was published earlier, then definitely give some of these a go. Now, uh, the first one that I'll, I'll be really talking about them pretty randomly because it's basically the order in which they are lying here next to me. The first one I'm talking about is The Long Take by Robin Robertson. Now, The Long Take by Robin Robertson is basically a story about uh, post traumatic post traumatic stress syndrome. Oh, I cannot pronounce it. Post traumatic stress syndrome, so PTSD. Um, in it we follow our main character who is coming back from, I think it was World War II which he was coming back from. He's a Canadian but uh, he doesn't really see that there's anything left for him in Canada as he says it at some point in the novel. His family in Canada is lost to him and so he sets out to the US to kind of rebuild his life there. And uh, we see him in like uh, different areas. I think he first we first see him in New York, I think we also see him in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken, and in LA mainly, I think. Um, basically, the story is, uh, the, the main thing that sets this story apart from other stories is, it's, um, is the way in which it's told, because it's more of like a lyrical style to it. The Robert Robertson is more like a poet who uses poetry to tell this story. Um, so it's also often done in like shorter paragraphs, I don't know if you can see it or not, and the language in it is very, like a visual language, is very much true images that you are being taken through the city. So basically I think it's very good at giving you a sense of the city, and a sense of the time as well. Uh, it uses a lot of imagery from um, cinematography and from photography, and so cinema also is, a, is something that is being... Um, refer to a lot of the time. He seems to be very much in the know on all of the uh, movies being filmed around the cities in which he's living. So this is very much a part of the book. Um, and very much, so as I said, about PTSD, so uh, very much about uh, the community of veterans and the way they are being treated, the way that they are basically trying to survive after the war and the little support that they are receiving about for this. And uh, also about just yes, shell shock and uh, really being uh, getting flashbacks to that time and to things that he saw during the war. I did like it, but I think, as I already mentioned, that its main selling point is that original form, is that beautiful lyric lyrical language. Story-wise, I don't think there's much there, so if you're somebody who's like a plot-driven reader, I don't think this is going to be for you. I think if you are very much into um, into the lyrical symbolical language, into being carried away and taken into a certain atmosphere more than into a certain storyline, character development line, then this is for you. But character-wise not much happens and plot-wise not much happens neither. So it's very much an atmospheric read. So I liked it, but uh, I did, it didn't blow me away or anything like that. But there were some very beautiful, uh, and there's really some very beautiful language in this that you get. So very beautiful language in this. Um, so if this is something that interests, so if this is something that interests you, definitely give it a go. Um, the next one that I'm going to go for another one because the one that I'm going to go for is 
I will explain later. Next one is Washington Black by Essie Adugian. Now Washington Black is about our main character, Washington Black, who is a slave on a plantation, I think in Barbados. And um, yeah, he's kind of distinguished in some point early on in his life because like the brother of the plantation owner takes an interest in him and kind of like takes him on as his like sort of project and like uh, includes him in his scientific experiments and like tries to um, better his life or anything like that. Due to circumstances he then has to flee the plantation and uh, we kind of follow him throughout several stages in his life in different, different places throughout life. And it's very much a reflection on uh, slavery, on whether you can ever be free uh, in the sense of him being haunted by his past but also in the sense of him having a sort of remaining with a certain sense of like um, loyalty to his former uh, owner, not to his owner itself, but to this kind of, to the brother of that owner who showed him some distinction, even though he was still very much a slave in that relationship as well, and uh, it was very much like he wasn't making his own decisions, this, this person was making the decisions for him, but he still feels very much endowed to that person, and it very much seems to be still seeking that person's um, approval and so this is basically what the story seems to be mostly um, discussing and mostly um, yeah mostly emphasizing for me I feel like I don't know I was expecting more of a like sort of fantastical whimsical voyage thing about it and I was kind of let down in that sense so it was more I guess a case of my um, yeah, my ideas about, my assumptions about wh where the story was going that kind of got in the way of me this. I was more expecting a sort of like uh, whimsical voyage with like a, a fun camaraderie and some nice uh, fun adventures. And it really wasn't that. It's really much more of a, a solemn book and um, we do we do go to very different places but it's also not like it made me feel like oh wow this is a big adventure going from one place to another and that I, it made me want to go to any of these places or anything like that so in that sense this book was for me the most disappointing because i'd heard some very wonderful things about it and so i guess this is the case with my uh expectations getting ahead of myself and so this for me wasn't as great. I still think that indeed it had uh, very nice passages, it, it took up some very interesting um, points, you know, it brought up some very interesting points about slavery and about freedom and whether you can ever be f fully free or not, but uh, for me this really didn't uh, pay out in the, in the end. Next up is the winner of the Man Booker Prize, which is Milkman by Anna Burns. Milkman by Anna Burns is set, I think, in the Northern Ireland region. Uh, and it's basically about some, some troubles between different groups and basically about the feeling of being watched, of constantly being in the public eye and constantly having uh, people judge you and the way that that uh, in turn steers your actions. Um, I mean, this is the book that I read first, I think I still read it, maybe even in 2018, um, but I could be mistaken about that. And so it's also the one that's like furthest in my memory, but I can also remember that um, I had a difficult time with this, I had a difficult time focusing on this. I have since read that uh, a lot of people say that like the structure, the language in this uh, novel is very much more of a like, not really a stream of consciousness, but it goes towards stream of consciousness, you know, lots of times you are struck in like a, a, a stream of ideas which are more um, structured than they are would be in the stream of consciousness but still end up giving you this sort of like rambly feeling where you're not really following anymore or where it's, it becomes more of a chore to follow in any case. I do remember there being some very nice passages in this and I really liked the concept of like uh, being watched, having to watch and like having a fear of standing out because when you stand out then people take notice and then it's easy to do things wrong. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, I appreciated parts of it, but I will say that for me in any case it was definitely a chore and it's definitely not one of my favorite books from uh, this shortlist. Next up we have Everything Under by Daisy Johnson. reason I didn't put it out earlier, so it was supposed to be the second book that I talked about, is because this is very much, I feel, 
of the same strain as uh, the long take, which is why I didn't want to discuss it right after I discussed the long, the long take. Um, but Everything Under by Daisy Johnson is basically a story about a girl who used to be very close to her mother, they, uh, but at some point her mother kind of abandoned her and um, she's now, years later, kind of going back in search of her mother. We get different perspectives at the same time and as we get through these different perspectives we're kind of gathering the story of what happened back then and uh, like what is happening right now. Um, and. I think the strong point here is the way it was with the long take, uh, but very much different, but it's also very more of a atmospheric book. This definitely has things happening to it, you know, it has more character development, it's very much more plots driven than the others, than uh, the long take was, but it's very much also a book in which symbolic language is very much, uh, is very much like at the center. If you don't like symbolic language, you're not gonna like this one. I know a lot of people who've, uh, I mean, I've seen a couple of reviews about this book in which people say that they couldn't get into it, that they had to DNF it, that it just was like, the language was getting to them, and I can definitely understand that I just happen to love symbolic language, so for me this was just absolutely beautiful to read through, because, um, you know, there's a subtext to everything, there's an image to a whole lot of things in here, and then, yeah, it was, to me, this really did it, this is really one of my favorite books from the shortlist, um, and, like, I think it's also one that you can easily reread and, and get a lot of extra things in about this book, you know. Uh, I, I, I think uh, what also interests me is a lot is that it also looks at the role of language and it kind of gives a discussion of, like, uh, language and the way that our world is, is, is kind of... Uh, structured by language and so if you create new words for example are you creating new realities is our reality created by the words that we use or can we create new realities by creating new words by using our own vocabulary our own language uh, and these are inter themes that always interest me a lot uh, so uh, yeah in this case as well uh, I really like that part of that reflection that's happening throughout the novel but in general as I said I really like the whole thing uh, I like all of this symbolism in there I liked um, I liked the sort of like dark fairy tale feeling about it so just this sort of monster that they've like created possibly by by giving him a name basically and uh, this whole like um, mysterious feeling that you get about the book about like is there really a monster what is this monster that they've created so that sort of setting that sort of feeling is something that I really enjoy a lot uh, when reading a book so this was definitely a top-notch for me uh, we're getting to the down to the wire and uh, we are up to The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner takes a look at um, life inside a female penitentiary um, so we are following I don't even know what her name is anymore. I was going to say Rachel, but that's the name of the author, so... Um, well, basically, I don't know anymore. So we are following a, um, our main character, who is, uh, who is sent off to uh, a penitentiary. Um, and, like, in all honesty, this is more or less what I remember about it. Uh, this is, like, one of the most recent ones. I think I read it in June or July. And I don't remember too much about it. It's about uh, the way that uh, females are treated in prison. It's about the way that they try to, um, yeah, the way that they try to work the system in their favor. The way that they're, for example, trying to find some like sort of benefactor outside of the prison who might uh, accidentally uh, fall in love with them without realizing that they're in prison and how they could uh, abuse this by maybe getting like certain benefits from him or something like that. Um, but basically, I didn't feel this to be anything special. Sure, this is the first book that I read about females in prison, but I'm sure there are more. I guess Orange is the New Black, for example. Um, and so for me, this really didn't do too much special. It's like interwoven also with the time, with um, parts of the story of when she was not in prison of before, but also that didn't really interest me a whole lot. So uh, for me, this book was nothing special at all and I'm actually gonna give it away 
And then the final book we're getting to is uh, probably at this point my favorite book for the year, and that is The Overstory by Richard Powers. The Overstory has since won the um, Pulitzer Prize, and I'm so happy for it because, like, when I read this one, I was really like, why did this not win the Booker Prize? Because, as I've already uh, indicated, I was quite lukewarm about um, Milkman by Anna Burns, but I really love it. But I can definitely see why some people would have like less of a like less of an attachment to this book than I do. The Overstory by Richard Powers is basically a story in which we follow nine different characters, I think, or nine different storylines, uh, which at first are all very um, they're all separate from each other, and uh, later on they sort of grow towards each other and they start to interlace. Um, but basically, we're following nine different storylines and the way that trees. Um, form a part of their lives, but also the way that they become a uh, part of the like sort of movements who try and save trees. Now this is a story about activism around trees, but it's also a story that gives you a lot of information about trees. And as I've heard from certain reviews, it is actually quite recent information uh, based on recent research into trees. So uh, the, the, some of the developments that are being mentioned are quite, uh, so are really recent, <laughs> stop saying the word recent, but so some of these developments are really like cutting edge uh, science or really things that are have just come out into the open and uh, which bring like, which bring to light an interesting new facet to trees, so the, like for example it's about the way that trees communicate with each other, you know. Yeah, basically trees are not seen as sentient beings, you know, they're seen as just like standing there and filtering our air, but basically what has been discovered is that they are actually communicating, they are using hormones, they are using um, certain uh, particles into the air to kind of give off warning signals to each other, for example, or to try and um, get a certain animals, I guess, to not to evade them or anything like that. But basically, I'm, like, I'm doing a horrible job explaining this, but so basically it's what this book is kind of trying to show is like they've been there forever, they've witnessed all these big events, and they are way more sentient than we have been aware of. They are, they are able to migrate when uh, like the, gra the ground on which they are standing is no longer suitable for them. That, of course, these are all things that are happening over so long of a period, but that's because they live for so long of time. And so I think this was wonderfully done. Um, like the first part, we get like these nine sort of like short stories about the way trees have played a role in these nine different storylines. Then we get a sort of interwovenness of different characters starting to come across one another. And then um, I won't give too much away. In any case, the book is structured around the concept of a tree. So it's not just about trees. The book is structured as a tree. So there's four nine individual stories are basically forming the roots of our stories and then when they start to interweave we get into the trunk and then they spread out again into the crown. Um, I thought it was wonderful. I think there are flaws, you know, there's a part of this book that I felt drained a little bit, uh, but even though I felt it drained a little bit, I still gave it a five star rating because there hasn't been a book like this for me in a very long time. You know, I absolutely flew through it in a way. I really, really was passionate about it. There were a lot of things being said in there that I just really felt that really hit close to my heart. And I've thought about this book so many times since finishing it. You know, I finished it in the month of July, so it's now uh, end of August. But there have been so many conversations in which I, which I brought up this book. There have been so many new stories or just other things that I've read or heard that have made me think about this book and the kind of conclusions that it was trying to reach. Uh, I do think it is a difficult book to sell because it's a book about trees and about tree activism and like it's it's not it's not going to endear you to tree activism neither. Um, um, at some point I was actually thinking that that was probably the point of the book to try and show you how tree activism is, is pointless and in a way it's probably showing you that and hopefully it's trying to sh and I think it's trying to show you basically that it's it's trying to be a warning call in that sense I think to kind of show like um, you know these people are trying to stop that and they're not getting anywhere so it, I think it's kind of a call to arms for in that sense uh, however, of course, if you're very much a skeptic about global warming, about um, the fact that we need to protect our environment better and things like that, and this book is 
definitely not going to be your thing because um, I agree with the message, but it comes across super strongly, you know, it's kind of totally in your face with the message that our trees are there to be protected and they need our help. It's really a cry for help. It's not a gentle nudging in a direction. It's not gonna, It's not like uh, secretly hid, hiding the message that this needs to be done. It's shouting, you know. <laughs> so in that sense, I can understand people not really uh, enjoying it in that sense. I mean, even I at some points was like, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it, you know. I'm sold, you don't need to, you need, you don't need to shout it off the roof. But um, I also think that structurally, structure wise, I like the concept, I'm just not entirely sure that um, it couldn't have been done more forcefully even. You know, uh, I think for me at least, the part about the seeds, I was a bit unclear about what it meant. I would have given a different interpretation to seeds, but in any case. Uh, I'm giving a like, super long explanation for this book and it's been, I really want to give a full review on this book. So I will try to stop talking about it now and hopefully leave something left for discussion afterwards. So overall, uh, if I have to choose like my best books and my worst books for this one, I will definitely say best book, Overstory by Richard Powers, closely followed by Everything Under by Daisy Johnson. Then like my lukewarm books will have to be first the long take, so on the positiver, the more positive side of lukewarm. I really did enjoy this, but I also think that it's really more the language which makes it enjoyable. On a really more like meh, Washington Black by S.E. Dugian. Um, yeah, I guess I just had very different expectations of where the story was going, and the story went somewhere else, and that didn't really manage to enchant me. You know, it wasn't like sometimes you can have a certain expectation, and then the book goes in a totally different direction. And you're like, yes, that is the way where the story had to go. You know, that's where the story had to be taken to, and that's indeed the right choice didn't have this with this one. And then I guess uh, if I'm going to choose one of these, Milkman, I at least still enjoyed what it was trying to do. It wasn't, the execution didn't really suit me as a reader, but I didn't, I did like some of the reflection that was happening. I did uh, think it brought up some very interesting themes. Uh, so my loser in that sense will be The Marshroom by Rachel Kushner, which I think is just really not for me. Um, like, let me know if you read this book and you thoroughly enjoyed it, or if you enjoyed it more than me, just what you uh, thought, thought to be like positive about this, what you gained out of this. But I think I really didn't get anything about, out of this, and um, that's just a, such a shame, because, like, yeah, I guess... Yeah, I guess the goal of reading the Book of Prize shortlist is to be introduced to certain stuff that you would have never normally taken up. I would have definitely never taken this up if it weren't for the shortlist. But the idea is, of course, that I'll be pleasantly uh, surprised by some of these. But of course, like reading tastes differ, and there will be a lot of people who probably did enjoy this thoroughly, but uh, sadly, that is not the case for me. But so like and subscribe if you uh, enjoyed my content. Definitely let me know if you've read any of these books and if you've already started in on the uh, long list for 2019, definitely let me know which ones I should prioritize. Uh, I think in the month of September I'm going to start my reading for the long list of uh, 2019. I already have one book on my shelf and I have two books on scripts. So uh, hopefully I'll get some reading done for the long list already in September. So I won't have to wrap up the shortlist in August 2020. But so yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed this video and see you guys next time. Um, I do not have a like fixed filming schedule, as clearly indicated in the beginning. So I film whenever, I post whenever. Hopefully you guys will manage to forgive me for that. Bye!